G'day, g'day, g'day. How we doing? Welcome back to another episode of the Cubane series. So we're obviously trying to make Cubane from household materials. We've been doing it for a little while now, quite a while. <laughs> if you've been following the series, you know that we've hit a sort of a bottleneck, a step that we knew from the outset would be pretty difficult. And it's turned out to be pretty difficult. The UV photo cyclization step. So for this step, to make the cyclization happen, we need to pump in UV light at approximately 300 to 350 nanometers. We have been trying to do that with some reptile lamps, which put out, I mean, a lot of light, some of which is in the UV range, and some of which, I suppose, makes it into our material, uh, but we're not seeing any real conversion. So I've got something very important to do in this video, which is cave in to peer pressure. We're gonna do some UV LEDs. Uh, they've been a popular option from the start. Before we get into building the setup, I wanna talk a little bit about LEDs and UV LEDs in particular, because they're really an area of technological advancement um, that's really happening right now. LEDs were first sort of designed or discovered, I guess, in the 50s or, or 60s. They were commercially available by the 70s. You could get quite high powered LEDs, but you could only get red, yellow and, and green. You could get infrared LEDs as well, but you could not get blue LEDs. So there was this huge lag in blue LEDs over all the other colors because of the semiconductor material that was needed. And it was very hard to dope that semiconductor material. It was known there was gonna be a, a huge amount of consumer demand for these blue LEDs once they were made, but it took until the 1990s to actually develop blue LEDs. And you know it was a hard problem because the people that developed the first blue LEDs or the first you know reasonable blue LEDs ended up getting the Nobel Prize for it in 20. 14. You don't win the Nobel Prize for solving easy problems. <laughs> so we had blue LEDs in the 90s, but they weren't used very much, obviously, because they were quite expensive. They're a new technology. While there's demand for them, they were very expensive. In the early 2000s, however, the price of the blue LEDs dropped drastically. And because the price dropped, they got used in more applications. And because they got used in more applications, more people went into manufacturing. So the manufacturing process got improved. So they got cheaper and it kept going. So now, I mean, you, you each of you, you know, at a computer or a TV can probably look around and find a blue LED um, you know, somewhere in, in your room. In just over 30 years, we've gone from something that was technologically impossible to do, despite millions of dollars of research a year, to uh, a product that is just um, you know, so commonplace. The reason I bring up blue LEDs is the same sort of development cycle is happening with UV LEDs. Well, the sort of deep UV LEDs. Once again, there's been a lot of potential demand for them, but there's been a lot of challenges in their manufacturing. The problem with UV LEDs is that so many materials absorb the UV light. So you can't have either the semiconductor or any of the substrate or any part of the LED actually absorbing that UV light. So you need to build your UV LED with UV transparent materials, which aren't that common and, and really adds to the complexity of making these LEDs. But you know, there were developments 10, 15 years ago that showed that it was possible and now we're seeing this sort of rapid increase. And because UVC light is a, such a good disinfectant, especially around um, 280 nanometers, there's this huge push, obviously in the last couple of years to make these new disinfectant UV LEDs. Then you can replace stuff like mercury lamps and you could, you know, really easily do um, sterilization if you had cheap available high power UVC LEDs. Obviously that comes with a lot of risks because UVC is not only an eye hazard but actually a skin hazard. So you're not gonna illuminate a room full of people with UVC LEDs, uh, that would be very bad. So we're kind of at that stage where the UV LEDs are mostly available. I mean, even a couple of years ago, you couldn't really buy on a consumer level like a UV LED. But in this video, they're, they're, I mean, they're still expensive-ish but you can just get them online now. And the price is just gonna keep plummeting. So within five to 10 years, uh, it's gonna look ludicrous that I even tried doing the synthesis with a reptile lamp because there are going to be deep UV LEDs, not everywhere, but in a large number of applications. Just like with the blue LEDs, there was a lot of applications that came in because they were cheap and available, stuff like backlit TVs and everything like that. So who knows what deep UV LEDs will go on to do. Obviously, safety hazard, safety hazard. You can't just put them in consumer devices. You know, you're not gonna put like a UV torch on an iPhone that puts out 280 nanometer light because 
you know, a child could turn that on and, and give themselves skin cancer. <laughs> you know, like they're, they're pretty hazardous. But there will be all these applications that will come in in the next couple of years that we haven't even thought of yet due to these devices. All right, so in this video, we're using 310 nanometer LEDs, 310 or 311 nanometer LEDs. Uh, they've probably got a, a width of about 20 nanometers. But um, yes, that's what we're going to try and do in this video. We're just going to be setting up the UV LEDs uh, and seeing <laughs> if I can get them working because uh, uh, my electronics knowledge is not the best. <sighs> ah, anyway, let's, let's get into it. Here are our LEDs. Look at these. All right, so they're 310 nanometers, uh, and I wish I knew more about electronics, but I don't. <laughs> so there's four stars, and on each star there's four LEDs. I will definitely need heat sinks for them. At least they've got copper backs on the stars. That looks good. But I'm keen to try and turn them on. I don't really know how best to power these. Um, they're 12 to 14 volts, but they said it only requires um, 40 milliamps, which seems very low, and I don't want to put one amp into these and then um, they're just like get absolutely blown up because they're not that cheap, right? I mean, they're affordable, as in they're probably $15 for each star, so this is probably $60 worth of LEDs. It's not like it's so expensive it's unaffordable, but it is expensive enough for me not to want to blow up any of these LEDs during testing. I reckon I'm going to allow myself one failure. If I blow up one of these, or one of these stops working during testing, and then I get it working, I'll be happy. Not, not, maybe not happy, content. But uh, if I start blowing up two or three out of the four, I won't be so happy. So we're, we're allowing ourselves one failure. You've got, to, you've got to leave yourself some room for error, especially on a channel like this. My God, do we have to leave ourselves room for error. I still really don't know how to power them. I, I've mentioned this. I've got this power supply. Um, it needs, what, 40 milliamps. I don't, I've asked about this on Twitter and I, I just don't get it. But sure, 40 milliamps. I don't know if, because some people are like, well, I mean, just give it whatever. And that's the current it will take. But like the current determines the brightness. I just can't pump a fucking 30 amps through it and expect it to be fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hook one of them up. I have at least one cord, so <laughs> Let's do this thing. I'm gonna put eye protection on as well just in case um, it emits the power of the Sun You know for 0.1 of a second before it blows up and blasts us with 310 nanometer UV light because I'm Sun smart Right no light as expected Hey, look at that. This is 12 to 14 volts. Can you see that on the camera? Yeah, I can see that with my... Oh yeah, all right, look. It suddenly draws a lot of amps. So once it goes above 12 volts, I guess it draws all those amps. Don't know if it's stable at like that, but... Oh, and it's drawing more and more and more. Okay. <laughs> all right, it did work. I have such low expectations. <laughs> Oh yeah, pretty warm. Pretty warm already. I mean, not hot, but definitely a lot warmer than the other ones. All right, I mean, it definitely drew like at least an amp of power when it was actually running. I don't know whether that's sustainable at that point. I, I think I'm getting caught up on this 40 milliamp number too much and I don't think it's that relevant. So if I just get a constant current supply, a driver that supplies, I don't know, I guess an amp at the correct voltage to maybe drive two stars at the same time, then, you know, should be all right, right? That seems right. It seems right. It seems right. I'm trying to convince myself here. It'll be all right. Okay, here's my eBay haul after the appropriate amount of shipping time. Obviously just outlets, uh, which will run into our LED drivers here, which um, will provide 900 milliamps to the LEDs up to 36 volts. So we should be able to um, power like two stars off one of these drivers. And 900 milliamps seems like a reasonable amount. We've also got this, this is a little timing circuit, um, which should be able to switch um, the power to the LEDs on and off, just so um, both the LEDs don't get too hot, but also the reaction vessel itself, you know, we can't let that get too hot. I don't really know whether to put this in the driver line, like 
you know, the 900 milliamps going around and it disconnects that or put that in the power line, disconnects the power to the, to the driver. You can take either uh, 10 amps at 250 volts, which, you know, is the power line, or it can take 28 volts of DC. Right, well, I think that's going to be slightly too much for it if we're in here and we're getting, you know, two of these is 28 volts. So I, I think it can go in either, either one. There's probably a better one to put it in, but that I don't know. It's just beyond my knowledge, so please comment <laughs> if I've got it wrong. Also, it does require power. Annoyingly, it requires a lot of power, 24 volts to come in here, which seems like a lot. And it's probably because I bought the wrong ones because they have definitely five volt versions of these. We'll see if I can get this working at all. Should be able to adjust the on off timings with, with these two, you know, rotational fucking switches. What's the term? See, I'm out of my depth. Look how much I'm out of my depth in this fucking episode. Okay, so I've got some heat sinks. Hopefully they're uh, suitable for the job. I'll just get these LEDs and, uh, you know, put each one on the heat sink. So I don't have any uh, thermal grease, but I do have some uh, high fluorinated vacuum grease. So I'm just gonna be using that instead on the heat sink and hopefully it's okay. No. Okay, no, that one's a joke. That one's a joke. I am gonna be using, what's this, thermal glue. But feel free to tell me um, this is inappropriate as well, because it might be, I don't know. I don't really know. People seem to be very particular about thermal pastes and glues and epoxies and whatever, but I don't know. All right, well, this thing blew up. It says it wants 24 volts. This is 19.5 volts. It's not over it. Um, there's been quite a few unexpected explosions in this lab, but I've got to say, this one really got me. <laughs> you can see that bloody transistor has absolutely carked it. So, yeah, uh, I'll have a think about what I'm doing. Fuck me, whoops. Anyway, we shall continue somehow. I got it working. Um, I only blew up two of the circuits. One of them was, you know, catastrophic, and the other one, I'm pretty sure I got the polarity wrong. And still works, but um, both LEDs blew up. But uh, here we are. I bought three. Well, actually, I was hoping to get two working out of the three, but, you know, immediately destroyed two. Now we've got one. So I really do want the five volt ones, because this fucking, using this huge transformer to power this seems ridiculous. We can change these off and on times. So make the off time really short. You know, now it's basically off all the time. And, the, and then... All right, so I've wired up this driver. I don't have an earth pin on this cord, which feels pretty irresponsible because there is a, a cord here for, you know, the driver's earth, although it does come out here. So I don't know, am I meant to just put it on the case or something? Please give me advice. I will switch this out for one with an earth um, if, if, that's what I need to do. It feels reckless to not have one. So I'm really keen to see if this driver actually powers up the LED or blows it up or not. Oop, sparks. All right, so I've officially cooked this LED. It looks like it's dead. I think the reason for that is I was running this one LED, which requires 12 to 14 volts forward voltage uh, off this 
driver which gives it 24 to 42 volts. I thought the LED would just use what it needs, but no, it, uh, it, it blew up. So to combat this, I've wired two LEDs in series so that if it provides the 24 volts, each of them get 12 volts, which seems to work. If I attach these two to the, to the, the benchtop power supply, they, they work at, at like the 24 to 30 volts. The risk, of course, is that if I blow up these two, then that's, well, I've got one more spare LED. I don't have any more spare heatsink. Hopefully they don't blow up because then I've got to really <laughs> go back and order some more stuff online, which will be several weeks. Turning it on, three, two, one. Hey! All right, I'll take that win. <laughs> I'll take that win. So even just after that 30 seconds there, the heat sinks are noticeably warm. I think it was less than 30 seconds. So the question is, do we put the relay in here or do we put the relay over in the power cord over there? Yeah, let's put it in here. Let's put it, let's put it in there. No, let's put it in there. I reckon we'll put it um, in the power cord there. So off. The LED goes on. They go on. They're on for about 12 seconds. They're off for about 12 seconds. And they're on again. Oh my god. Amazing. The electronics are working as designed. Shocking. And I keep forgetting how unimpressive these look on camera. How unimpressive the UV looks. So here's, here's some paper with some, you know, <laughs> highlighter on it. Yeah, you can see that UV lighting up. Spread out pretty well, but you can get up close to it. It's very cool. All right, so they're working. We've just turned the LEDs off for the moment, not to blast the room with so much UV. But yes, um, now that they're working, I can actually <laughs> make the solder joints a little bit more um, manageable and think about how I'm actually going to use this in a setup. Where do I aim the LEDs, you know? All right, what do we think? Metal reaction chamber, the LEDs inside. Heat sinks protruding out the side, so I'll put like a cooling fan on the outside so that the heat, you know, dissipates there. Uh, and then, you know, the, the steel in there is vaguely reflective for the UV. Obviously, I'll do the wiring a little better, which I keep saying, but once again, it doesn't look that impressive until you put something like a bit of paper in there. Wow. <laughs> I really should be wearing skin protection around this. I don't know how I'm going to cool the reaction mix. Maybe I'll drill some holes in the bottom and put another fan on the top and cool it um, through the middle there. We can also scale up, you know, we can put more LEDs if needed. Yeah, something like this. Cooling fan, classic cooling fan. Should, you know, keep the um, the heat sinks cool enough. Whoop. Don't look directly into those UV LEDs, but that's pretty good. You know, I think it's pretty good.